My name is uh, Chalmer Hathion. I'm a physical oceanographer from the Faroe Marine Research Institute here in the Faroe Islands. I'm going to talk about uh, some short stories from the northeastern Atlantic and how physics, uh, physical oceanography influences uh, ecosystems. So select the short stories from the northeastern Atlantic. You'll see the species there on the screen that I'm going to focus on, the whiting, mackerel, herring, and also zooplankton and more. My outline is uh, I'll focus on this thing called the subpolar gyre. And then it's enumerated one to five, as you see. Then we go to um, the big increase in the blue whiting stock after 95. And then uh, the mackerel expansion after 2006, when they moved westwards towards uh, Greenland. Then it's a focus on uh, uh, a feeding region north of the Faroes between Iceland, uh, uh, Norway and the Faroes, also called the Fridge. I think it's a good name. I just learned it from Ola. Um, talk about oceanography there. Um, zooplankton and herring. Little word on capelin, and then uh, say something about the uh, mesopelagic uh, movement of, of biomass vertical migration. Uh, this uh, subpolar gyre cooling cold, dry winds, they cool water over, over the Labrador Sea, produce what they call Labrador Sea water. They fill up this big subpolar gyre, cold and low saline uh, waters, big gyre that uh, circulates uh, counterclockwise. To the south of this, we have the uh, Gulf Stream and the subtropical gyre. Some years back, we could show that the marine climate in the northeastern Atlantic is governed by the relative contribution from these two gyres. If the subpolar gyre is strong, then temperatures and salinities are low, but they can also weaken like this and open up a window and allow more subtropical waters to come north. Then the temperatures, they will rise and the salinities will go up and the ecosystem will change. To reflect these changes, we produced a so-called gyre index. Time series goes up and down from the 60s to 2005. Um, that is the black dashed line. And then we put salinity in the ocean on top of there from Rock All and uh, southwest of uh, Iceland. And salinity is a good marker of water masses, where water is coming from. It's a good tracer. And as you see, it comes, it goes up and down. And there were market changes in the mid 90s from a very strong gyre. It was cold and fresh. And after 95, 96, it weakened suddenly and temperatures and salinities increased. And we had profound uh, ecological changes. We call that as the mid 90s regime shift. Uh, this system is also characterized by salinity dips. Every now and then, every five, eight years, salinity goes down. And that often reflects on, on the increased productivity on the adjacent shelves around the subpolar gyre. So here I will, I have many subparts, and I will end each subpart with this black banner that kind of gives the, the conclusion from that part. So the conclusion here is that the subpolar gyre regulates the marine climate in the northeastern Atlantic. Then to the fishes, blue whiting. They occupy a huge and variable region in the northeastern Atlantic. You also see that's a blue region there. And on top, you see mackerel in the yellowish and the herring with the reddish colors. These fish, they uh, spawn west of the British Isles uh, in the spring. And then after that, they migrate past the Faroes on the eastern and western side, uh, north to this feeding region, uh, north of the Faroes, the fridge, primarily, but they also extend farther west and north when the stock is large. Then in the winter and, and the early spring, they move south again to the spawning region and spawn again. And they are very sensitive to the marine climate when they are spawning. And uh, so we here compare, this is temperature. This long record is the temperature uh, in the Rockall area west of the British Isles. It goes up and down from 1900, uh, warm in the 50s, 60s and down again. And compared to the black a thick line is the, the biomass or, or the stock, the whiting stock. And you see this market increase in the mid 90s, increased suddenly as the gyre weakened and the temperature increased. And after that, it went down again. This is an old study, so it's, unfortunately it's not up to date. I'd like to learn more myself, but major changes when the, when the gyre changed. 
And if you look in space, that's just a, a time series in space. So during this period, but before the mid 90s, when the gyro was strong, then the fishery was limited, as you see now, to the European, the continental slope. The, the, uh, the reddish colors show lots of fisheries, so it's kind of limited to the, to the slope, while just a few years after, the, the fishery really extended further uh, west over the Rockall uh, Hatton Plateau, and also especially between Iceland and the Faroes. So both it increased and it extended westwards, both the, the spawning pattern and also the migration afterwards. So we wrote about the spawning region down south and also the migration afterwards. And I just realized now that there's a kind of a time lag between what I'm seeing here and what you see. So I'll try to, to accommodate for that. So the bottom line from this part is that when the gyre is strong, it is limited to the European continental slope. The stock is small, but when uh, the gyre weakens, becomes warm, the stock increases, and there's a westward expansion. So here's a, yeah, I can see the time like this. So this is going to be a challenge, but let's see. That was take home message number two. Then the third point is mackerel, which you see now. They spawn also west of the British Isles, and they used to move up to this region between the Faroes and, and the Norway. But after 2006, they started to expand westwards to the Faroes, Iceland, and even Greenland. This post 2006 um, expansion, and this, this is a million dollar question, why did they move west? And now apparently they come back again. So if we look at a section from the British Isles and towards Greenland, this red line there, then most often when people talk about climate and ecosystems, they talk about temperature. So down south, it's warmer, and going towards Greenland, it's colder, bluish. And as the climate is warming up, this shifts thermal barriers towards the north, where biota can follow after. So in this way, the fish is allowed to extend its uh, area. But I would claim that they, they are spawning west of the British Isles, so if they could stay there, they would not just move hundreds or thousands of kilometers just be, because they can, but probably because they have to. Because what happens down south in spring is that nutrients and the, the system needs nutrients just like you need to fertilize your lawn. The oceans need nutrients in order to, to sustain the primary production and therefore food. And this region becomes nutrient limited and therefore food limited. So the fish cannot stay there. And that way they are forced out of the region or being pushed. And the truth is, of course, both as the climate is changing, it's warmer, they can go farther, but they are also more pressed with the nutrients. Many nations are conducting what are called the international uh, surveys of mackerel in, in July. Many ships, they are sailing around. And what you see here in the colors, the uppermost is the distribution average over 2009 to 14 of mackerel and of zooplankton, which they love to eat. Columns in March, because it's called. And here we see that uh, the frontal region east of Iceland, it's a reddish, that means lots of zooplankton, that's also the fridge. Frontal regions are, are productive and, and rich. And you also see that that's also where we have the most uh, of the mackerel, north of the Faroes, Iceland, south of Iceland, and even uh, the southwest of Iceland. Now look at this region just south of Iceland, there's absence of both uh, zooplankton and also the fish. And certainly it's warm enough, so they're not limited by temperature. They are limited by something else. That's the nutrients. To look at that dimension there, or yeah, they in July they're just seen in this narrow corridor just south or along the, the Iceland slope or shelf. So now we, we are drawing a section. We love to do this. Physical oceanographers love to make sections in the ocean, vertical sections. So we cut it towards Iceland. So we have Iceland on the left, and then depth down, and the colors, they show nutrient levels. And where it's uh, uh, bluish colors, that shows there's limited, uh, or the primary production of algae is limited by nutrients, 
and therefore you cannot have sustain a large biomass of zooplankton, which is fish food. So when the mackerel have been spawning and they are seeking, urgently seeking food, they don't like to stay in that oceanic desert. They will rather move out of it and to regions which are more productive, which is frontal regions or near the slopes where you have continuous supply of, of nutrients. Now, the nutrient level in the oceans is not steady from year to year, it changes. So some years back, we could show throughout the subpolar North Atlantic, all the way from uh, the Labrador Sea in the west, the reddish color there, with the L, if it comes on there. It's delayed. There it is. And in the Immigrant Sea, IR, the blue one, and the reddish in the Nordic Seas. This is from the late uh, 80s, and there has been a steady decline of the nutrients throughout. And that's surprising and a bit scary because th this would mean that the subpolar uh, North Atlantic becomes less productive. And since we know that the waters um, west of the British Isles, you see the colors there, the bluish are limited by nutrients while the reddish are richer in nutrients. So in the region west of the British Isles, which is already low in nutrients, on top of that, we have this trend so that nutrient limitation becomes more severe and the incentive for the fish to move towards regions that are richer in nutrients increases. This could also explain the westward or northward expansion of fish stocks. So climate is more than temperature. Uh, we need to bring in the nutrients and many other processes as well. Then we move north to the fridge. And I only just told, told me about this, uh, this term, which I think is a good one. Fridge, you got it's cold and it's a farrow ridge could be and feeding region. So it's a good term for this feeding region up north. We see the Atlantic inflows between Iceland and the Faroes and uh, west of uh, Iceland. But these water masses, as they pass the ridge between Greenland and Scotland, they're meeting cold waters from Greenland uh, coming south. And uh, this establishes frontal regions. And also, this flow from up north, it brings really big, fatty, uh, juicy uh, zooplankton down. So there's a continuous stream of zooplankton coming down. So let's focus in on this uh, uh, fridge region. There it comes. Look first at the oceanography region. This is a picture from floats that are circulating down at a thousand meters depth. These are uh, located within the Norwegian Sea. You see this racetrack going around there. And the blue ones that come in soon, they come from Greenland and or the Iceland Sea. You see kind of two streams coming south and there's a confluence east of Iceland as they meet this. So there's a, a canyon just east of Iceland that's really important. And then they continue further south towards the Faroes. And this uh, flow it fans out towards uh, the east. This is a bit slow. And there's also a track going further north. So we have a connectivity from north south towards the Faroes. But this racetrack continues. So it also brings water masses towards Jan Main. And as I just recently learned, um, there have been changes also in Jan Main with cod and so on. But that's out of my or I haven't learned more about that yet, but there's connect connectivity around this racetrack, you could call it. And that racetrack is called the Nor Norwegian Sea Gyre, which comes here in reddish. Big thing that circulates around counterclockwise. This feature is super important for the entire marine uh, ecosystem and, and the marine climate in this region. So let's have a look at this uh, zooplankton river from from Iceland. This is temperature map at uh, 100 meters depth. This is the year 2002. And you see how the Atlantic waters, they are coming from south and they're meeting the waters from north. And we also term this, you have an ice term there, and this tongue coming down south, we call it the Icelandic tongue, is a critically important feature for the feeding conditions here. These uh, scientific uh, cruises, they also sample uh, 
uh, zooplankton in May. This is also from an international cruise or many years on average in May. That's the biomass, reddish colors have much and bluish are poor. And we also see that this Iceland ferrofront divides the richer region with more zooplankton up north from the poorer in the Atlantic waters. So definitely this region is rich in, a, in a zooplankton. And especially of this type, it will come in now, it's called uh, Calanus hyperboreus. It's the cousin of Calanus formaticus in Faroese Rei Alta. It's the most important food item for these pelagic fish stocks. This Icelandic tongue is not constant. It's everything in the ocean is moving. All boundaries are moving all the time. And especially after the year 2002 to 2003, the Icelanders call it the year without a winter. Really anomalous uh, uh, conditions in the atmosphere. There was a clockwise anomaly in the air masses and also in the Norwegian Sea Gyre, which caused this Icelandic tongue to retract westwards. So its extension towards the pharaohs was, was uh, decreased. And you had, it was more reddish, more, some people call it uh, Atlantification. We had the Atlantification of the Nordic seas, warmer, more Atlantic-like. And as we know that this blue tongue is really rich in, in, uh, in zooplankton, then these physical changes must have had an impact on, on, on the zooplankton biomass, which it has. In the Faroes, the Faroe Marine Research Institute has monitoring this section north of the Faroes, we call it section N, this black line from north or from the Faroes to north, uh, for many, many years, several times a year. And then we get to these oceanographic sections, as you see there. This shows salinity, and the reddish colors are salty, Atlantic, and bluish are more Arctic. And you see the front, fronts like the Iceland Faroe front are not just on the surface, but they have a subsurface signature, and this hits onto the first slope at depth. We have the wedge of Atlantic water, and underneath, if you can see it, uh, it's bluish color, it's called MEIW, it stands for Modified East Icelandic Water. It's a derivation of uh, the Icelandic tongue that sinks north of the Faroes, rich in zooplankton. So we can make a time series of this because we have been slicing through this hundreds or, or 130 times in many, many sections with our research vessel. So it's like cutting a sausage. Uh, if you cut through there and that reddish area there is large, that means we have lots of that water. And if that reddish area is small, then it's less influence from, from Iceland. So just with the area there, we can get a time series of the, the Icelandic influence north of the Paris, which also brings in the zooplankton. It's a bit messy figure, but the red colors there, they show the area in million cubic meters, no, square meters, and the thick red line shows a kind of an average trend in the Icelandic influence. And you see that it used to be a lot in the 90s, but suddenly after 2002, the first time it went down to zero influence was in 2003. And uh, we also measure along this section, the zooplankton. Now this is Calanus hyperboreus, which is endemic. It's native to the Icelandic waters. And it also, at that same time, it was much in the late 90s, early 2000s. And as you see in 2003, it disappeared. Small wiggles and so major changes to the zooplankton community north. And the disappearance of the subarctic zooplankton species went away as the Icelandic tongue retracted. Now, this is published work. What we are doing right now are trying to extend this picture in, in space also. So in every, every given place, we can estimate the thickness, as you see, uh, of that uh, layer in meters, how thick is it in every given place. And with large uh, hydrographic or temperature salinity databases, we can see how this is in, in, in space also. The, the color scale, uh, dark bluish colors show a thick layer and uh, whitish colors are, are a thin layer. And we start with 95 in the top and then I don't need to see the numbers, but I can tell you that the market decrease between uh, 2002 and 2003 is, is evident just north of the Faroes from bluish colors to 
to abstinence. And then we have many years with absence of this uh, Icelandic influence until, as you see there, 2017 and 18, North of the Faroes is a bit small on the screen, but then increased again. So we had an increase in uh, 18 and 19 of more influence again. And what we're doing right now are, is trying to compare our results from the, the Faroes, this reddish section, with uh, a similar section from Norway. They call it the Svinus section in Norway. And uh, one basic finding is that the trend is pretty much the same in Norway. We see this decl decline around 2003. Also Norway, not down to zero. And then the slight increase again is very similar, both in Faroes and in Norway. So we're trying to write this up now. Uh, the bottom line is that we had, again, increased influence after 2016. And that the change that we have observed north of the Faroes impact a large part of the Norwegian Sea. Good. Then what? Then we go one step up. This is also work in progress into the herring in the fridge. Herring, uh, as opposed to mackerel, they are feeding by just filtering lots of, of uh, smaller zooplankton. The herring, if they get to choose, they pick the larger ones. They're, they're picking food instead of just filtering. So they like these, either the big stages of Calamus finmarchicus, or it's a larger cousin from Iceland, uh, Calamus fibroboreus. So a, a, a hypothesis that we are working on right now is this. Herring is spawning along Norway, as we know. And after spawning in the early uh, spring, they are seeking out in the open ocean, more productive waters. But fish do not move further than they have to. And they move until they encounter food and they start feeding. Just like if you were picking berries in, in, the, in the field. And if you find that region with enough berries, you'll just stay there and pick them until you used it and then you'll move on. And as I showed you, if you remember, we had before 2003, lots of this soup not coming in. Which could mean that the herring did not have to move that far to get to the source and to this river of soup plankton. Just move it out until they encounter enough of large juicy soup plankton and they just stop feeding. While after 2003, we could expect uh, a southward shift of um, the fish because the source was uh, weakened. There was less uh, soup plankton, so they had to see seek the delta or the, the mouth of that Zooplankton River and thus start moving towards Iceland. Does it occur? Here we're looking at herring and the large ones because they are stronger and they are more focused. They, they go where they want to. And this is what they call the center of gravity of those larger herring. And the bluish colors, they show the years before 2003 and you see that we're in three, far north, but after that, they start, started to move south towards the Faroes and Iceland. And in 2005, they came down to this region, if you recall, this confluence of waters from, from Iceland Sea and from Jan Main, just north of that canyon in the seafloor. And ever since, they stayed down there, very congregated, focused in that region. So this is clearly a, a good spot for feeding. And to have a closer look at that, we take all the data, and this is from uh, scientific acoustic surveys in May, different year classes. And on the left, the young ones, are, this is early in the year, but all the old ones have already found that bullseye east uh, of Iceland. And later on during the year in the July, you see even the small ones and they all really congregate along this Icelandic tongue. So it is clear that herring is likes this Icelandic tongue, tongue and for the zooplankton it contains. This is work in progress, so you'll hear more about that later on. Um, I promised Ola to say a bit of this. This is very immature. This is brand new. The fact that uh, Capelin recently, this year and last year, maybe also in 18, but especially this year, uh, started to migrate. We found them in large uh, 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 biomasses in the Faroes. I know very limited about Capelin, but I can tell you that uh, the main spawning region used to be south of Iceland or southeast Iceland, while uh, this year they also find them spawning north of Iceland. 
they are also endemic to Icelandic waters, so they come from there, and clearly they must come from there. Uh, those that we see in the pharaohs, there's no other way. So uh, this is safe to claim that they are either brought with the Arctic water or the Atlantic waters, or both, towards the pharaohs. So this is a field of active research, and uh, I guess we'll learn much within the next few years, years of this. Then we get to my last point. This is the same section north, if you see there, north of the Faroes, our, fav our favorite section N. Looking from uh, the east, we see the Faroes on the, on the left here. And this is acoustic data from our research vessel. So in May, it was steaming south there and just measuring acoustics as they went. And then this, these are data that's moving really slow, this one, um, of acoustic data. This, this type of data that's used by, by the scientific community to estimate the biomass of all these stocks, actually. You see many structures here. The colors are the backscatter, how much biomass is in the water. You see this, uh, the ship is going down. You have two nights and one day. On top you see a moon and a sun. And you see something, the cloud is going up and down. That's the, they call the diurnal vertical migration of, of the mesopelagic community. So in nighttime, they come up because they're safe and they're feeding near the surface. And they go down and hide in, in, the, in the day when they're visible. So avoid the uh, visual predators. In the same region, just north of the Faroes, should come in now, we have um, current meters that are used to measure the flow in this ferro current. And they are called uh, ATCPs, acoustic Doppler current profilers. So kind of an inverted echo sound. They're sending sound up and listening to backscatter and they calculate the, the current velocities in the ferro current, which you also see by these, uh, the black lines show temperature lines. You see the, how they are, uh, the sloping temperature lines are emphasizing the, the ferro current. And uh, when uh, the scientists have this type, type of data, they go and scrutinize them closely. They call, call to judge this data, and they can find out what, which species they represent. And the uh, upper left the panel, we had that same section uh, judged or scrutinized, and that's herring. And the upper right is blue whiting. Then we had two other layers, layer one on the lower left, and then layer two. And this, that's what uh, this uh, uh, paper we just submitted to a journal. In, in the scientific community, we write about these things and send it to journals and when it's accepted, then it becomes kind of science. So this is also new. This is the deep scattering layer. It uh, mostly consists of uh, small uh, mesopelagic fish, krill, shrimps, and, and more also, pr primarily those species. And to investigate that layer, we have made use of our ATCPs or current meters north of the Faroes. You see them small dots there. And we see very interesting and clear patterns. What you see here in the middle panel here is depth is on the vertical axis and you have one day, 24 hours. And you see in the upper panel shows the sun. When it's above that dark line, it's over the horizon. So it's day, when it goes underneath it's night. And you see how the biomass is reacting to that. As soon as the sun comes up, you see that the, the, the light bluish colors, they descend down to some depths and two layering also, different layers, different species. And nighttime, they come up again. They do it every day. Furthermore, at the lowest panel, you see the colors there. This is a directly measured uh, uh, velocity. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll just have a sip here. So these HPs, they directly measure the vertical movement of uh, these small critters. And uh, when they go down, you see bluish colors. That means negative velocities. They, they go down. And uh, in, the, in the evening, you see the reddish colors. They're coming up again. They move about three to five centimeters per second, this biomass goes up and down. And my last point here today is that now something, yeah. 
if we average over a day, then often we see an increased uh, backscatter deep down somewhere. That's a deep scattering layer. And if we add the dimension of current velocity in the ferro current, we see that this deep scattering layer is situated just underneath the ferro current. And this is also uh, characterized by temperature. It's just under this uh, layer where temperatures are changing from low, say one degree or so, <coughs> up to six degrees, that's Atlantic water. So just underneath or in that cold water, they reside, probably hiding from visual predators above. One of those predators is the blue whiting, as you see there, this is the reddish colors. And uh, if we focus or look into details over that region, you have the first slope to the left, and you see the colors, uh, the green colors are the temperatures. This dotted backscatter is the blue whiting, and underneath there is a more cloud-like, that is probably a krill or mesopelagic fish, or shrimps. <coughs> And you see how they're just hiding because the blue whiting does not like to go much below four degrees. So they're just residing underneath there. And at nighttime, when they're not so visible, they'll go to the surface and feed and then go down again and hide. So this uh, concludes my, uh, my many slides here. Questions are certainly welcome. And I will end by simply stating that the subpolar gyre and this Icelandic tongue, they do regulate pelagic fish stocks in the northeastern Atlantic and the Nordic seas. <laughs>